Hey guys, welcome into another episode of the Guilty as Charged podcast. We've got a really fun episode for you today. We have our very first prospect interview with Notre Dame defensive end Dalen Hayes. Uh, he was kind enough to take some time to uh, talk with me and Alex about his experience at the Senior Bowl, you know, his strengths, what his experience was like at Notre Dame. Obviously, you know, Chargers fans are very well versed in <laughs> Notre Dame NFL prospects. Uh, he is apparently <laughs> well versed in that discussion as well. Had a good time joking around with him. Um, and, and then we're going to talk about, you know, the, the kind of future of the defensive line and linebacker cores. Obviously, that's a little bit up in the air with Brandon Staley coming on. So obviously, it's going to change a little bit. And we're going to talk about that. Um, first and foremost, Tyler and Alex are here with me as well. Alex, how are you doing, man? Um, doing pretty good. Uh, it was a great interview with Dalen Hayes. And yeah, he was a great interview on the show and hope we get some more uh, draft prospects between now and the next uh, 80 days. Yeah, we got we got to pick some things up there and uh, maybe get some guys on. Hopefully, this is the first of many. Um, I'm pretty sure that it will be, but uh, we'll see. Uh, Tyler, how are you doing today, dude? I'm doing well. You know, if, if Hayes comes on the show, I think that means based on our history of interviews versus drafted, I think that means he has like a 25% chance of being drafted. <laughs> because he's from Notre Dame, that means he has an 85% of being drafted <laughs> by the Chargers. So, yeah. you know, I think his odds are improving every day. Yeah, no, I, I actually do think he would be a really good fit um, on the Chargers. You know, I think he's got some good versatility, which was kind of the theme of our discussion with him. Mm. Um, but I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see who the Notre Dame player is this year, because I think everybody knows that it's going to happen at this point. Um, but there are some really good options this year. You know, they've got a few offensive line prospects. They've got Hayes and another edge rusher. I don't think they'll take the Notre, the linebacker because I think he's probably going to be the first round pick, but. Uh, they've got some good options there as well. So we're going to transition right to that interview right now. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about it more some after that. So guys, take a listen and I hope you enjoy. All right, guys, we are so happy to be joined by our first prospect interview of the draft season, Mr. Dalen Hayes out of Notre Dame. Dalen, thanks for taking the time to join us. How are you doing today? Doing good, man. I appreciate you guys having me. Yeah, of course, man. Thanks for joining us. And, uh, you know, we're honored to have you on. This is a big day for us because it's, you know, really the symbolism of the start of draft season for us. And, you know, couldn't be happier to have you on. And uh, obviously you just had your, you, you just wrapped up your time down in Mobile. You know, you did a lot of different things. You covered with, you covered uh, tight ends and running backs. You rushed a passer from the defensive end spot. Apparently you crushed the interview process down there. What was your time like down there in Mobile during the senior bowl? Um, it was awesome, man. It was it was it was a grueling process. Like if, any, if any, anybody would tell you, it was it was tough, but it was it was definitely a great time, man. I, I had fun uh, competing against the best guys in the country, and uh, you know, being being exposed to like you know those those formal interviews that we had, like we met with every team uh, down there, and uh, yeah, man, just the opportunity to compete was just it was just awesome. It's something I'll never forget, man. Was there maybe one tackle or or a tight end or a running back that you kind of were like? okay, I'm like really excited to go against this guy and, and maybe learn something from him. Was there maybe one guy that you were most excited to go against? Uh, the kid from North Dakota State, I forget his name. Dylan, uh, Dylan I don't Redu yeah, Redunes, yeah. Redunes, yeah. He, he was a pretty good, he was a pretty good tackle. I, you know, just, I had never heard, I, I didn't know who he was coming in. I didn't know who anybody like really was aside from our guys going in. Um, but yeah, man, it was, he was a real good, he was real good. Uh, we had some real good battles and uh, yeah, I felt like it was, it was a great matchup throughout the week. So he was, uh, he was probably my favorite guy to go against. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, Notre Dame uh, guys on the chargers, <laughs> right? We got uh, Jerry Tillery, you got Drew Tranquil, yeah. uh, Mar Bilal <laughs> played some last year, right? Yeah. Um, Lohi. If you, yeah, Lohi too. <laughs> yeah. More than I, more than I remember. <laughs> um, if you had to pick, you know, if you were to be drafted by the Chargers, what would be kind of the uh, exciting part of getting to play with some of those guys again? Yeah, just building on Notre Dame West is what we call it. <laughs> <laughs> so West Campus is, is really dope, man. Um, yeah, just another, another opportunity to compete with my boys. Uh, those are guys, man, I've known since I was 17 years old, man. Like, we all grew up together, uh, you know, like, grew, like through the process, uh, competed. We've won a lot of games together, really shifted the culture um of Notre Dame and getting it back to where you know what I'm saying the standard of, of Notre Dame and, and that winning culture you know we really uh were, were like that class that really changed uh th between those two that 2015-2016 cycle uh were, were huge and instrumental in like you know that shifting of that culture so uh, just another opportunity to you know um uh, go to a different team compete with your brothers and then 
you know, hopefully do the same thing, just continue to, to build on a winning culture together. And, you know, uh, you know, that tightens the brotherhood, you know, the more you win, everybody's happy. So uh, just another opportunity to do that and build upon like what we were able to do in college will be great. Yeah, you know, we we have this running joke that, you know, you mentioned the Notre Dame West, which is was hilarious because we, we all talk about it too. Uh, we all kind of assumed that it was going to be Troy Pride last year, and then obviously they, they drafted Alohi Gilman. So they're, they're, they're really close to being able to assemble a, a full Notre Dame defense, which I think would be hilarious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they just need, you know, they draft you, they get the defensive end, they get a, another safety, another corner, and they're, and they're pretty set out there. Um, you know, you mentioned the culture of Notre Dame. Do you think that's what kind of sets it apart from other places? I mean, obviously, you know, Alabama is Alabama, but you, know, you guys have been pumping out NFL players really well. Obviously, the Chargers have taken notice. What do you think it is about Notre Dame that kind of, you know, produces NFL players at, at such a high caliber? Um, you know, even less than, you know, uh, NFL players, just, you know, professionals. Um, if you really look at what no, what is required of you at the university, and you're competing in the classroom against some of the most bright, you know, some of the brightest minds that you'll, you know what I'm saying, come across in your life. Um, and then you're turning around and playing football at the highest level. I mean, the the, the discipline, um, the work ethic, um, the consistency, and like, you know, really like the grit that it takes to kind of go through that process uh, as a 17, 18 year old kid um, and come out a 21, 22 year old man on the other side of that, man, it's no, you have no choice. Uh, but to really grow and, and thrive. And you you take um, an extreme case like Notre Dame where you're competing at the highest levels both on and off the field and, you know, you go into regular life and it's just like, wow. Like I was really prepared to, you know what I'm saying, take on anything, really. You know, Notre Dame, Coach Kelly, our process, you know, our culture, um, you know, really breeds professionals. And uh, I think that that's the biggest thing, you know. I mean, obviously guys come in tal- talented. I mean, they obviously wouldn't have been there from the get-go, for, but to be cultivated and refined into a professional over your time in Notre Dame, I think is what really sets, separates us. Um, who are some of the guys that you either watched growing up uh, playing football or that you watch in the NFL today that you think you model uh, your edge rusher game after? Honestly, a lot of uh, Shaquille Barrett, man. I love watching Shaquille Barrett, and uh, I love watching Bud Dupree. Uh, those are two those are two guys that I really like started to hone in on like really just you know what I'm saying just like really watching that film obviously you watch the grace Khalil Mack um Vaughn obviously um let's see TJ like I mean you watch a lot of, you watch a lot of great edge rushes but as far as like who I feel like I can who do I play like I feel like who, with the type of edge rusher the type of presence I bring I feel like it's more so along the lines of like Bud Dupree and Shaquille Barrett yeah, I mean, yeah, Shaquille Barrett had a really good Sunday, so <laughs> that's a good player, to, a good player to model your game after. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, it's funny that you mentioned those two because obviously, you know, they're both three, four outside linebackers. Um, you know, you were pretty versatile at Notre Dame, and I mentioned what you did at, se- at the Senior Bowl. Do you feel like you would be better suited to play like a three, four outside linebacker, or could you play in a, in a four, three edge rusher too? First two Denver Bowl, I was playing uh, defensive end, 4 3 defensive end. I was just standing up. I'm just a stand up guy. I don't really get into three points too much. Uh, well, ever. Uh, but uh, and then the last day, I played Sam Backer. So, you know, I could do I could do pretty much either one. I mean, my biggest thing with Notre Dame was just, you know, like our, our defense wasn't necessarily um, one that like would allow us to really like pin our ears back and just get after the quarterback and like really put our pass rush on display. So, you know, that's why Mobile was so important, being able to go down and, and just showcase that I can be a dominant and effective edge rusher. Um, and I showed that throughout the week, all week, you know, whether I was in as a as a Sam linebacker or as a uh, stand up defensive end. So, you know, but what also uh, with Notre Dame, what I la- what I did, what I lacked in as far as like, you know, an ability to just truly pass rush, I gained an experience as far as covering the back, sp- spy on the quarterback, you know, uh, contain peel on the running backs like a lot of different things where I was just, I was asked to do a lot overload fronts playing in at the three tech, you know, there's really not a down that I feel like I need to come off the field because I can line up anywhere. Um, and I can do a lot of different things. I can cover, I can spy, uh, running back tight ends, whatever, lining up at the three, rushing at the three, rushing at the edge, um, set, set the edge as, a, as an edge defender. So, I mean, I feel like I, I have so many valuable reps as far as 
uh, in game and down, whether it be at Notre Dame or down in Mobile, where I was just able to showcase my, my real versatility as far as there's not a down that I need to come off the field. Um, I can do pretty much anything that you're asking me. Um, I know our defense, I know our defense at Notre Dame in and out, and I'm going to bring that same mentality to an NFL team. So, you know, I, I really just feel like, you know, down at Mobile was an awesome opportunity just to showcase um, my full skill set, you know, and be able to do so at the highest yeah. level, again, highest competition. So, Yeah. So in this exercise, imagine I'm GM Tom Telesco, and I'm going to ask you to put yourself uh, over some of the other guys in this draft. What's the one quality that you would say Dalen Hayes has that maybe some of the other defensive linemen in this draft don't have? Yeah, I just think ability to play at any time. Like I just said, like my versatility, man. I feel like there's there's no down where I need to come off. There's no, um, as far as setting the edge and the run. Um, that's what um, I think that there's no real um, limitation as far as what I can do on a football field. And I feel like there's no limitation as far as uh, the roles that I can play within a defense. So. Um, I feel like my versatility is what separates me from a lot of guys because there's some real good pass rushers in this group. Yeah, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of great pass rushers. So, you know, I feel like we can all rush the pass it really well. But I feel like what separates me is just my versatility to do that and also affect the game in other ways. Uh, you know, interceptions, interceptions just as valuable as a sack. You feel me? Uh, yeah. You know, things of that nature. So, um, just my versatility, I feel like, is what separates. Me. Yeah, you know, I, I totally agree with that. That's something I noticed about you on tape. Like, you know, I was just watching the Duke game uh, earlier today uh, and you lined up over the guards a little bit. You dropped into coverage. You rushed off of the edge. You set the edge really well is something that I've noticed. So I think, you know, that versatility is huge. How would you say that playing against, you know, a guy like Liam Eikenberg or Robert Hainsey in practice every single week has helped you prepare for the NFL? I think it's I think it's been huge. I mean, we sat. I remember uh, me, Ade, Rob, and Banks down at the Senior Bowl. We were like, man, our practices at Notre Dame, our camp practices, we felt were like just as intense, if not yeah. like a little bit more intense than those those uh, couple practices at the Senior Bowl. Like because we have top talent. I mean, you even go back a year ago, right? You have Julian, Khalid, myself, Ade, Liam. You know what I'm saying? Our entire offensive line revamp. Like, I mean, some of the battles, man, that we were able to have in camp and, and, and uh, throughout the years, uh, just kind of growing growing together, man, as players, it's, it's, it's been insane. So uh, the intensity, the work ethic, um, and then the talent level that we have on our team, man, is it, just crazy. So, you know, that that definitely prepares. That prepares us because you got to bring it every day. You know, you got to bring it every day against those okay. guys. Uh, and they have to bring it against you or us. One of us is going to lose and it's going to look bad. So, <laughs> uh, you know, just kind of, you know, that intensity and that consistency that that we all, you know, really had to have uh, as competitors uh, going up against each other. We're really talented. So it, it's been it was a it was a hell of an advantage. I, I, I felt like I love that, man. You just rattled off like 10 to 12 future NFL players or current NFL players. I think that that is amazing. Uh, some definitely good experience there. And uh, I'd be really interested to see those practice videos, man, you know, getting all those <laughs> NFL players onto one one-on-one unit. I think that'd be a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. Alex, did you have any other questions for Dalen? Oh yeah. Uh, what's sort of the uh, role that you, you know, you talked about, you've done a lot of things, right? Uh, what's sort of the one role if you had to choose uh, that you think you would be most comfortable uh, doing at the NFL level? I feel like I'd be comfortable doing it. All of those things that I've, you know, like I said, that it's not like um, it's not like a, a thing where it's like I can do it. It's things that I've done mm-hmm. you know, throughout my right. time. You know, the biggest yeah. game, like I'm, I'm doing the same things like, you know, you'll see in Clemson. I'm like, I mean, the game winning set like was at, at three tech. You feel me? I was dropping in coverage like all that whole game, you know, like, I mean, I, it's nothing that I really feel like. Um, where I, I feel more comfortable. I mean, the, if I had a preference, it would be rushing the pass just because I feel like, you know, that's the best way to, you know what I'm saying, like change the game is, you know, getting after the quarterback. So, um, you know, rushing the pass would be my favorite, but I feel comfortable doing them all. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's well spot on. So you've got just over, I think it's 80 days until the draft. Uh, how are you going to spend the next couple months leading up to that, leading up to that weekend? Working. It's working. <laughs> nonstop. Nonstop. Obviously, like the draft is, is a huge monument. Like that's a big, that's a pivotal point where you find out where you're going. But after that day, those that day that you find out, like now it's time to compete. 
and go help a team win. You know, you got to go like you got like same mentality, like in practice, man, like our practices at Notre Dame, like you better come with it. So you better be ready to compete. You better be able to, you know, be able to uh, go out and help a team win, man. As far as like, you know, that's, that's just, that's just my mindset. So everything I do up until that point, man, it's all gas. Like I'm just working, just working, working, working. And when that time comes, man, it'll be time to put that work on display. So I'm excited. I'm excited. And you might be competing with a dog like uh, Joey Bosa opposite of you. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> that would be awesome, man. Well, Dalen, thank you so much for joining us, man. We wish you nothing but the best. This was an amazing interview for us. Uh, and, you know, regardless of where you end up, hopefully, obviously, it's the Chargers. But regardless of where you end up, we will be rooting for you in the NFL. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Absolutely, man. I appreciate you guys having me, man. Thank you, for For real. Uh, I appreciate it, guys. Yeah, man, Thank you. you. All right, guys. Have a good night. All right, so that was Notre Dame defensive end Dalen Hayes. Again, thank you so much, Dalen, for taking your time out to, to uh, talk with us. Alex, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about about Dalen Hayes and, and maybe some things that you learned from, from our discussion with him? Yeah, no, uh, I, I thought it was interesting just that he compared himself to uh, Shaq Barrett and, and yeah. Bud Dupree, who are both, you know, two, three, four uh, outside linebackers. Daly switching to three, four, so – Something to keep in mind if that's, you know, if he were to be drafted by this team, if that's kind of a role he wants to play. But uh, no, yeah, I, th I think he hit the nail right on the head uh, in terms of his versatility. And that's kind of why he stands out in this draft. Uh, Tyler's favorite word there. But um, I, I think that it's uh, he'll be an interesting prospect if he's there on day two. Uh, I sh certainly wouldn't mind taking him uh, and, and making him a charger. Yeah, I think that's that's a good call. Really, you know, his words like he, he is he is a very versatile prospect and you know when you watch him on tape he lines up against the on a, in the three technique on the outside he'll, he'll drop in a coverage um you know i thought down in the senior bowl he had a great week covering tight ends and linebacker or tight ends and running backs excuse me um really showed some versatility i think there are some things he needs to work on and he talked about his battles with dylan radunes i think you know against some stronger offensive tackles he's going to have a little bit of an adjustment um, but he's got some really good hand technique. He's got some good versatility. Uh, I'm not, I don't think he'll be a second round prospect, but maybe, you know, with one of those compensatory picks in round three, he would be a fit there. And we'll talk about some of the other guys too, but, um, that was a, a really fun interview for me and, and just kind of picking his brain about, you know, maybe why Tom Telesco likes going to Notre Dame so much because, you know, they do have such a rich, uh, draft prospect pool every single year. Like I mentioned earlier, they've got seven or eight guys this year that will probably be drafted. And I think it'd be an interesting one to uh, bring him in to be an outside linebacker. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I, th I think he would be a, a good fit here. Um, kind of depends on what the team does with Melvin Ingram and some of the other moving pieces this off season. But uh, without a doubt, I think he's one of the better day two uh, talents in the draft uh, from the outside linebacker spot. Yeah, I'm not taking anybody in the first or second round at edge unless some miracle happens in the second round where somebody falls. But in that third round, like you see in a mock draft or like Hayes, like you're talking about, they've got two picks and I'd, I'd sure love to see them use one of them on an edge guy. Yeah, absolutely. I think they have to, honestly. You know, yeah. like the way that you run a 3-4 defense, and, and this is obviously, you know, transitioning to the how it relates to the Chargers now, but you run a 3-4 defense, you need four outside linebacker types. Like you, you just need that kind of depth and – and, you know, we saw that, you know, if you look at like the Denver Broncos or even the Green Bay Packers, who's run a three, four, you know, the Green Bay Packers use Preston Smith. Uh, uh, what's his name? Gary, Rashawn Gary and Zadarius Smith. And they rotate them at a really high level. And obviously, you know, with the Rams last year, you know, they had Leonard Floyd. They had a couple other guys who I don't really remember their names, to be honest. But, you know, you need three, four high level athletes that can do that. Now, with the Chargers, it's going to be interesting to see what Staley does with Joey Bosa, because. Yeah, You know, it, it seems like the logical thing to, you know, put him in an Aaron Donald-esque role. Obviously, Bosa is not going to be a defensive tackle, but, you know, move Bosa around and not just have him only be the defensive end. Tyler, do you think that same thing kind of works uh, with Bosa as well the next year? Yeah, and as it should be, you know, TJ Watt complains about or has his little thing about not being defensive player of the year. <laughs> But he is double teamed less than Burns, Brian Burns. And when you're double teamed less than Brian Burns, I don't, I mean, not that Burns is terrible. He did, he did a number on Trey Pipkins, I believe. Yeah. Um, but 
Joey, for him, if they can find a way to scheme him to not be double teamed so often, despite the fact that he has like one of the highest win rates against double teams, to, even whether it's just using the linebackers to confuse what's going on, throw in James to bring in different rushers, whatever, finding some way to get him some one on one reps is outstanding. And I, I think yeah. that Staley is going to do that better than we've ever seen under Gus Bradley. Yeah, I think that just getting him more into one-on-one situations or just changing the matchups is, is really the key. Um, I don't think you're, you're ever going to have Joey Bosa just permanently one-on-one, but I mean, you saw so many sure. times where he was double teamed in the last few years and yeah. it was like, all right, well, he's double teamed. So we need someone to step up, whether that's Jerry Tillery or someone else on the defensive line. And sometimes it worked. Sometimes it didn't, uh, you know, for, you know, when that line was healthier and you saw this at the beginning of last season, you would have a game where, uh, you know, Jerry Tillery would have like five pressures, some QB hits mm-hmm. or like uh, just Linval Joseph being active. Uh, I think you had guys that had that potential, but then line gets injured. Ingram goes down, Bosa eventually goes down and it's, you know, just the line (laughs) that's what happened unfortunately so um and you know you you talk about Aaron Donald and a lot of people talk talk to me and say like Joey Bosa is an Aaron Donald and it's true you know I think Aaron Donald is the best pass rusher but like in a few key statistics like Joey Bosa is not far off I mean he in pass rush win rate I think this year he was only 0.2 percent behind Aaron Donald uh in second place in the league right so Joey Bosa even though he's not uh technically Aaron Donald and he's not going to play defensive end uh I I think that you know uh Brandon Staley can still use him in a way that will benefit this whole defensive line uh even better than Joey Bosa has been his whole career as a charger yeah and you know it's gonna be really interesting because you know I've talked about this but you know Joey Bosa has mentioned uh, a few times that one of the reasons why he chose going to Ohio State instead of Alabama was because that Alabama played a three, four, and he didn't want to be an outside linebacker. So, you know, Staley is going to have to do some work to like convince him to be like, Hey, this is my vision. I'm my whole thing is about getting you one-on-ones and making sure that, you know, you're not going to be a, an extremely double team player. Like you have been in the past. And we're going to be able to move you around and, and rush over the three technique rush from the five technique rush from a wide nine, like an outside linebacker. So it's going to be interesting, but, you know, I cannot wait to see what he does with Joey Bosa because, you know, he, you know, Alex just mentioned he was one of the most efficient pass rushers in the league last year, but, you know, he missed some games and then he was double teamed all the time. So it's going to be fascinating to see what he does with Joey Bosa next year. I'd love to see, well, not love to see. I'm curious to see what he's going to do at two different time points. One, the beginning of the season, especially depending on how the offseason goes because of the pandemic, you know, how long is it going to take to transition to what he actually wants? And then two, I think they have four good linebackers on this team that can go away pretty quickly as we saw last year and the year before. And I don't know, let's say if you lose, you know, Murray and Tranquil, do you start playing more four three? Do you start bringing in a chin and Wosu as your edge rusher? So I'm, I'm just really curious what, how adaptable is this defense? Is it, I assume it is very adaptable because that seems what Staley's MO is, but you know, what is he going to do when the injuries start piling up? Do they have enough talent? Like you said, you need, multiple outside linebackers so uh that's the part that only that well there's many parts that worry me particularly jerry tillery um but i'm, I'm worried about the defense overall because these injuries i don't trust okay i don't trust anyone on this team to either be to be both productive and available for 16 games there's no reason i should trust in wosu unfortunately there's no reason i should trust joey bosa linval joseph is 33 you know yeah. jerry tillery hasn't proven it kaiser white's injured you know, Kenneth Murray just had a, a shoulder and whatever labrum, you know, tear. Yeah. Um, Drew Tranquil just got hurt. So it, uh, they can be, you know, flexible and adaptable for so long. But after a while, these injuries are going to potentially pile up unless the new sports science guy works a freaking miracle. <laughs> but <laughs> which, yeah. I, I don't know. We'll see. Um, so that's my only concern moving forward. Yeah, speaking of uh, Lamondo, it's like, they have a sports science guy now that actually <laughs> takes care of these things. It's like, yeah, they didn't really have that before. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. He seems to be, um, he seems to be really liked when he was in Denver. So again, you know, another hire from that Denver time. So interesting that uh, we keep getting those. I know it wasn't specifically him because I believe he was an assistant, but 
Denver was also one of the most beat up teams last year. So <laughs> yeah. we'll see how this goes. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's a step in the right direction. I'm not going to sit here and pretend to know anything about Lamondo. Sure. Um, but you know, I, I think, you know, Tyler just wrote a fantastic article for LAFB about the Chargers becoming, you know, a modern organization. And I think this is yeah. another step in that direction. Um, we'll have to see. I don't think that this will have like an immediate effect on the team. Like, you know, you just mentioned, you know, the Broncos were doing this already and yeah. they were still getting injured. And that's another thing is like people keep trying to blame the medical staff for the injuries it's just football. Like, you know, Derwin James is one yeah. of the most jacked up, twitched <laughs> yeah. up athletes in the, on the face of the earth. And like him having these injuries, it's just a freak accident because he plays football. So I'm not expecting this team to like miraculously be more healthy next year, but I think it's going to change some things, how this team prepares. Uh, and that's obviously a good thing going forward. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not just the Chargers. I mean, we just watched the Super Bowl and the Chiefs yeah. you know, had like, all their guys injured in that game. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, the torn plantar in his foot, and you have your two offensive linemen down, right? So um, it, it is just luck of the draw sometimes, even though it seems like the Chargers do get more unlucky uh, than other teams. It's, it's a violent game where people rip each other apart. So, <laughs> yeah, you yep. know, that's where I think we just have to remember that sometimes. Um, and you know, that's the thing where it's like, I remember people, uh, a season or two seasons ago, were going at like, oh, jo you know, what is John Lott doing? Cause the players keep getting injured. And it's like, well, if you go back like two years ago, there was another guy and four years before that, there was another guy. Yeah. Like, this stuff just kind of happens. It's, it's luck. Um, you know, the team left at the end of the year is usually the team, uh, that was healthiest through the season. And that kind of ended up being the Bucks this year, who, yeah. who weren't injured very often. Uh, and so uh, that's usually what happens. Yeah, you know, and their pass rushers were healthy and the Chiefs offensive tackles were not. And side note, also, I love the fact that all these quarterbacks now are coming out talking about how trash <laughs> their offensive lines are. It's yeah. like, you know, Russell Wilson, like, I'm sorry, you don't get to have this conversation, man. Like the Seahawks, no. by every measure, by every metric are a top, 10 12 unit in the league and Patrick mm -hmm. Mahomes oh you had to deal with some injuries man I'm like welcome to the <laughs> club it only took you four seasons to experience right. offensive line injuries man right yeah I mean let me know uh, when you play six you have six right guards in front of I you know. <laughs> one season in your rookie year yeah let's give uh let's give uh, Patrick Mahomes Trent Scott and see how he likes that one <laughs> <laughs> someone like that um oh, and man. I think I think there was an interesting stat on Russell Wilson that I saw on uh, PFF where apparently like 14 of the sacks he took were his fault this year yeah um you know and that you know that's it's pff and all that but like that's like you know we could talk about offensive lines but like quarterbacks who are like running away too much and like you know try to take something out of nothing often get themselves in, in trouble yeah, and we've seen absolutely. that with uh guys like uh russ or wentz where you know it's not totally on the offensive line at that point yeah, you know, that's the thing with Russ and Patrick Mahomes. You know, if you look up and down the the, the PFF sheet after every single game, you know, Patrick Mahomes, you know, it, it gives him like four or five pressures and a sack because he holds the ball so long. And, you know, Kyler Murray was another one. He retweeted that uh, Jim Nagy tweet about offensive linemen uh, and how the Cardinals weren't good enough. And I'm like, you guys, like, you need to chill out. Like, I understand, like, you know, Tyler said, you know, Patrick Mahomes is not wrong here. But at the same time, it's like, you know, you just lost a Super Bowl. Like, why are you throwing your offensive lineman under the bus in this situation? And the only guy who has so far never done that is the worst fucking athlete I've ever seen in my life at quarterback. <laughs> the fact that Philip Rivers, who, who can't save his life for shit, has <laughs> never thrown his guys under the bus is ridiculous. Yeah, if Philip Rivers, you know, wanted to break the no curse streak and, and launch an <laughs> F-bomb at, you know, Trey Pipkins or something, I wouldn't have blamed him. <laughs> I would not have blamed him at all, dude. You know, you're sitting there in Oakland just getting trashed because Trent Scott and Trey Pipkins are your two starting tackles. Oh, Ugh. man. The fact that he'd never cursed in football, like, is just crazy to me. Um, anyway, this is conversation has changed a little bit. So let's get back to uh, the defensive line conversation because – you know, I think the Chargers, they do have one outside linebacker on the roster in Uchenna and Wosu. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing with Unwosu, and I took some heat for saying that he was potentially a draft miss. He's been so inconsistent. And then last year, he was not healthy. And now he's heading into a different position again, because last year he bulked up to play defensive end. And now he's playing 
outside linebacker instead of, you know, weak side linebacker. Like he's changed positions three or four times already. So there is a little bit of uncertainty there. Do I think he can excel as an outside linebacker? Yeah, of course. He's a very talented player. I just don't know, you know, really like projecting him is difficult because he's played so many different positions. He's struggled with injury. Uh, and I don't know how this change is going to affect Uchenna and Wosu more than anybody else this year. Yeah, I, I don't think Uchenna and Wosu is ever going to be like a full-time starter. I think at this point he's a rotational player, which I don't think is bad. Uh, I certainly think he's going to be a good contributor uh, coming off the edge and stuff. Uh, I think he's going to be good, but it's also not what you necessarily want in the second round, right? As opposed to someone who's going to be right. a, a permanent starter, right? So, uh, you know, it, it ultimately depends on what way they want to go. Uh, there, there's a world, I think, in which someone like uh, Uchen and Wosu can, can carve out more of a role in this team. Yeah. But if the question is, you know, would I rather have, uh, I don't know, Leonard Floyd, or would I rather have Uchen and Wosu as a starter? I mean, it's not particularly close. <laughs> yeah, Floyd coming over, I still feel like the safety coming over is more likely from the Rams. I will give Nwosu a vote of confidence on my end, particularly interesting because I'd never before the season i wasn't really a fan like watching him play his limited yeah. action in 2019 some good flashes and then just disappeared whereas this season just you know, other than the injuries i thought he was very good when he was on the yeah, field absolutely um, stronger more effective against both the run and the pass so i will give him a vote of confidence and i think he can do it but you'd be foolish to not also take someone like a quincy roche in the third round or second or yeah. whatever and it ends up being um, so I think he can do it, but there's no way you should trust him to do it for 16 games. And then especially considering his contract up is up after this year, I believe. Yeah. So you need to start preparing for him either be hurt or be gone or both. Yeah, they absolutely have to be proactive in this situation. It's the same thing with cornerback, right? Because the cornerback group, mm -hmm. you have Chris Harris and Casey Hayward's contracts who are up after this season and Michael Davis is a free agent. So they've got to be proactive in this. They Luckily, they've got nine draft picks, potentially more. Uh, I loved Tyler's scenario in his mock draft today where he traded down. Um, love that kind of thing. But, you know, I, I think it wouldn't shock me. You know, we had this conversation with, with Daniel Popper. It wouldn't shock me if they targeted a Aziz Ojolari in the first round instead of an offensive lineman or a Quiddy Pay. I think if you're talking about like the highest upside of a three, four outside linebacker pass rusher, to me, that is Aziz Ojulari. He's such an insane athlete. He was only a sophomore this past season. I think he's only 20 years old. Um, I'm a big Quiddy Pay guy as well, but, I mean, he is a senior, so there is a little bit of a difference there in mm. terms of upside. Uh, and I think athletically, Ojulari makes sense. So I have been very firm on my offensive line or bust stance at pick 13, and I still will be firm on that stance. But if they took Ojulari... I would understand why, because they really do need to upgrade their pass rush and, you know, the uncertainty of Unwosu's health, his role and his future on the team. Like I would understand taking a pass rusher at 13. I just wouldn't love it. What do you have him graded bear compared to your like Darisaw, Slater and Cosme? Uh, let you me can tell, you. tell us. Yeah, I can tell you for sure that Ojulari is my highest graded edge rusher. Okay. Um, so he is my edge number one. He's got a grade of right now of 6.85 out of eight. Um, okay. Second would be Jalen Phillips. Um, and then third is actually Quincy Roche. Nice. So um, obviously there's the value there, the debate of value, whether you take Ojulari in the first round or Quincy Roche. If he's there in the third round, that's a no brainer for me, but totally. You know, I think in terms of upside, like Ojulari, you know, we just saw what we've seen what Shaq Barrett has done the past couple of years and what TJ Watt and Bud Dupree, like Ojulari has that upside to me of being like an elite, you know, 13, 14 sack, 50, 60 pressures a year kind of guy. Well, that's a high endorsement. You know, I wouldn't panic if that were the case. So long as they took care of one guy in free agency, one offensive line spot in free agency, yeah. maybe a second on you know another interior offensive lineman. I'm okay with that. If they can, they'll probably realistically do two upgrades this off season. Yeah. And I think that's enough to just like, that's okay. It's not, it's not everything, 
but we have multiple years here with this coach and with this quarterback. So I could see that happening. Actually. I'm hmm, I'll have to watch him. Uh, um, I tend to think Quiddy pay will be off the board by the time the chargers get there. Uh, I, I think he's probably going to go in like that top 12. Um, the interesting guy who I think could be there is Gregory Rousseau, but people are so all over the board on him. Yeah. Uh, I know Steven's not a big fan of him, but like, you know, but someone like Marcus Whitman would say like, you know, he is 19 years old. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's like, what, what's the ceiling for this guy in terms of what he can be two years right. from now. Right. So there, there is that um, outside pass rusher upside that, that Steven mentioned. Yeah. You know, Rousseau is an interesting fit to me. He would be more of a three, four defensive end, which isn't necessarily a bad mm-hmm. thing. Like I'm not sticking Rousseau on the wide nine and asking right. him to, to drop into no. coverage and do things like that. No. But you know, he is, he's probably is the toughest person to evaluate in this class because mm-hmm. he has one season, you know, he redshirted his real freshman year and then he had his actual freshman year in 2019 opted out this year. So like he's got one season and he looked really good in certain things. It, it's just, he's so raw and it's very similar to Panay Sewell. Although Panay Sewell had two years of starting experience and in, instead of one, but you know, athletically, like I could see someone taking a shot on on Rousseau in the top 10 just because of his athletic profile. But, you know, if you're talking about an outside linebacker, like that's not him. And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it's going to be really interesting because, you know, everybody knows like they need an upgrade in pass rush and a cornerback and an offensive line. And so if they opt for some band-aid offensive lineman, you know, taking an outside linebacker pass rusher at 13 suddenly makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, I think if they go in the direction of like some of the guys we've been talking about, like uh, Thune, Lindsley, or uh, Villanueva has been rumored, right? If they go in that direction and they up- upgrade one of those guys, and then maybe um, instead of a big money guy, you go out and you get John Feliciano or someone like that, who would still be um, kind of a huge upgrade relative yeah. to this offensive line. I, I think that that might be the likely scenario where they spend sort of one big money guy and one middle money guy. And then maybe uh, the first round offensive lineman doesn't become as present uh, or as like important, but I feel like it kind of still will, would be just to get uh, a really good all O lineman on that rookie contract. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I have no idea if Telesco doesn't improve the offensive line in free agency at all if he's still going to take an offensive line <laughs> like, yeah. none of us really know what he's uh, going to do in the draft well he'll take a guy from notre dame i'll tell you that there you go yeah <laughs> liam eikenberg come on down yeah i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't be opposed to that i'm a big eikenberg guy yeah me too i know i know a lot of people <laughs> he's not the most athletic guy and that's kind of notre dame's thing right like that's what ronnie stanley was you know he wasn't the most athletic yeah. guy but you could like you know that ronnie stanley was going to be a stud I think Liam Eikenberg is going to be a stud too, but you know, I think ultimately I do think that Tom Telesco is going to take an offensive lineman at 13. I think, you know, that's been like the biggest knock and, and him coming out and saying like, we do need more talent up front. Uh, I think right. that kind of indicates like, okay, we're, we're going to see an offensive lineman in, in the first round. So to me, I feel like, you know, if you're drafting an, another pass rusher later on, obviously, you know, we could talk about Dalen Hayes, Quincy Roche in the third, um, Hamakar Rashad out of Oregon State is an interesting one. Uh, he would be a second round pick. He's getting a lot of chatter right now just because of his physical upside. Like the dude had like 22 tackles for loss in 2019 out of Oregon State. So he's an impressive athlete, but you know, he, he's a second round pick. And I don't know if the, the Chargers would spend a second round pick on an outside linebacker. I think it would be more of a day three uh, venture there instead of, you know, second round, maybe one of their third round picks, but. Um, I think Hamilton Rashad is probably out of their uh, price range. What do you, do you think there's a possibility that they feel that I don't think this would be smart football, but do you think there's a possibility that they think they have enough defensive talent and athleticism at linebacker and at safety at Derwin James, that they can find ways to generate pressure without having to take another outside linebacker or edge kind of guy and just roll with the guys that they have. Well, I think that they would take at least one, but you know, we could like, it stands to reason that we could see them do the opposite of what the Panthers did last year and only take offensive players. And, you know, say Brandon Staley, like, you know, we'll give you the chance to work with these guys that we already have. Mm-hmm. Um, but with nine picks, I can't imagine they take nine offensive players. So I think they'll take at least one or two defensive players, but 
Uh, I do think it's going to be an offense heavy draft. Yeah. Uh, I think in general, it's going to be probably an offensive heavy draft, but I, you know, I think the edge range that you're looking at or like outside linebacker range is probably between rounds three and like five. I think, yeah. I think that that's the range that if they're going to take a guy, it, it'll probably be there. Um, I certainly think edge and corner. I, I think you can sort of pass on upgrading all the other stuff or you upgrade it through small things in free agency. But I think you got to get at least one outside linebacker or one, and one corner probably in the draft. Yeah, I, I would agree with that too. I, I think, you know, that round four is probably where we see them take it. Or again, maybe that and that's late third round pick. So I'd be interested in a guy like Joe Tyron out of Washington. Uh, I think I mentioned him, mentioned him before, but um, he's not the most polished pass rusher in the world, but you know, you can see the bend and flexibility that you like to see out of pass rush. He's got really, really long arms. Um, and, and he has the tendency to dominate at times. It's just the fact that, you know, he's another opt out guy and it's a little tough to evaluate, but you know, the potential is there. Another one that I've seen commonly mocked now that they're doing the three, four is Jordan Smith out of UAB. Um, he's not as athletic. He's a little more stiff, but, you know, I think there is some good potential there. He had a good week down in Mobile. Um, Alex mentioned Ellerson Smith, the uh, defensive end out of Northern Iowa, somebody he liked at the Senior Bowl. He's somebody that I would be interested in turning into an outside linebacker, Um, but I don't think that that's someone that you could count on as, like, somebody to start from day one. I don't think Joe Tyron or Jordan Smith would be either. Um, but those are some guys that I think could make a lot of sense on day three for the chargers. Yeah. And in the way of depth options, some, you know, I was just kind of looking through the spot track page and seeing, you know, who's a free agent that could like make some sense. Um, Cause I, I don't think they're going to go get some of the crazier priced offensive line back uh, outside linebackers, but you know, they did switch back to three, four and someone who's familiar with the chargers uh jerry attachu is a free agent you know if they want to get him as sort of a depth guy i I wouldn't mind that and we talk about rams coming over a lot and one of the rams who is that kind of who's been that outside linebacker presence uh has been samson ebucom uh you know if brandon staley want to bring him over i think he could kind of be like a tough physical hitter of course these are more rotational guys yeah. Um, but I think these are also the guys you're talking about taking in like round four, round five. You're not expecting a guy to, to start right out the gate um, in that aspect. No, it's a good call. I, I don't know the Rams guy that you mentioned, but yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had a, he had, it right. It sounded like he, he had some big plays. I mean, um, I, I think he's kind of famous for the, uh, the big chiefs uh, Rams game that happened a couple of years oh, ago. Okay. I think he had a touchdown in that one, oh. um, but he's, he's been solid sort of as a rotational piece. He's not like a, a big starter there, but he could be someone that kind of grows into a bigger role. Yeah. I mean, then th- that's what the chargers are going to have to do this, this off season. They're kind of going to have to play money ball where they maybe can't go after all the big names, but they have too many holes to fill. Yeah. They can't just pay one, you know, giant free agent. They're going to have to find little ways to patch up certain things and find depth rotation and whatnot. So, you know, good call. I'll keep my eye on those guys for sure. Yeah, I actually wrote uh, Jeremiah Tauchu in, in my uh, free agent article a couple days ago. So I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, he's, he's not been, obviously he's not really panned out into like that second round pick that everybody would have hoped, but he's been really solid in Denver as, as a backup behind uh, Bradley Chubb and Vaughn Miller. You know, I, I want to say he had mm-hmm. like 25 pressures and four sacks last year. And I think this year was relatively the same. And, you know, those are the kind of free agency deals that Tom Telesco has been you know, known for is you take a shot on yeah. a guy who's been a backup. And if he pans into a starter, great. If not, then you, you know, you're, you're only playing a backup. And, you know, I think, I do think that they don't necessarily need a big name. I would love to see Leonard Floyd just because like, you know, 11 sacks, according to PFF at 45 pressures, like that would have been awesome last year next to Joey Bosa, take a lot Jeez. of pressure off of him. Um, yeah. But, you know, we'll have to see it as it, you know, I think the one thing that Benjamin Solak talked to us about, you know, Alex and I is, you know, they need to figure out what to do behind Linvod Joseph as well. And so, yeah. you know, that could be something that a lot of people are not really talking about and, and taking a defensive tackle in the draft 
letting him sit for a year behind Joseph and then play. Um, you know, that's the thing with who they have right now. Linval Joseph is the only nose tackle, right? You, you know, you're mm-hmm. not going to stick Cortez Broughton or Justin Jones at the nose. Like they're going to be the defensive ends. And so, you know, if they're, I, I haven't looked into much. I know that Tyler Shelvin out of uh, LSU is amazing at it. He's like one of my favorite players to watch. Um, but I don't know if they'd be able to get him. So I think, you know, don't be surprised if you see them draft a defensive tackle you probably haven't heard of uh, and have him be Limbaugh Joseph's backup next year. That's definitely a position we are not talking about enough, and we should be. I, I don't think he's going to be cut this season, Limbaugh Joseph, and there's no reason based on his performance to be. Yeah, um, He is due $11.5 million this year, though. Um, so I'd like to see, which is a little bit much for a guy who's going to be 33 going on 34. So I'd like to see them him get extended in one of those fancy Telesco extensions that's – yeah. You get another year, but you really don't get any other year. You yeah, know, you might. I mean, if you're Brandon Meebe and you get four more years. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you. Oh God, Limel Joseph has been much better than Brandon Meebe. This is not so the same better. situation, but they are yeah. both on the older side. So, um, you said Shelvin is his name from LSU. Yeah, where is he projected to go right now? You know, he's another opt out guy, so it's it's mm-hmm. been tough, and he's he's a v- very much a traditional run stuffing tackle. Like he, yeah. He, He's not going to be, a, you know, a, a super, you know, get a lot of pressures guy. But, you know, we saw what Vita Vea has done for the Buccaneers defense, the difference maker that he was. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if you can get a guy who can, A, just set the line of scrimmage and not get pushed back, which is what he's so good at, and then B, you know, toss guys around in, in the pass rushing game. And even though he's not like a stereotypical pass rusher, Vita Vea is taking on double teams because – you know, the quickest way to the quarterback is right over the center. And so, you know, I think that's an underrated thing. Linval Joseph, like, you know, he, he, he's not going to play all 16 games again next year. Like the odds of him missing time next year are, are really high because he's 33, going to be 34. And so they've got to do something there. Like I mentioned, you know, are you going to have Braden Fajoko be the primary backup to Joseph? Like that's, that's a little rich to me. He didn't even play nose tackle at LSU. He played defensive end at LSU because of Tyler Shelvin. So, you know, they've got to get some, some beef behind Joseph uh, to be able to, you know, not have the run game run, the run defense fall off a cliff. If Joseph miss any, misses any time. Yeah. I, I think there's gotta be some push probably in the draft. Cause it's, it's not a great free agent DT class. No. Um, Nadama Kung Su might be the star of it. And he's like 34 um (laughs) and you know you kind of go down the list it's not guys who are like really great fits or or it seems like guys maybe that you would overpay uh into kind of a bad deal um i I wouldn't mind seeing damian square back Uh, i think he's been a good source of leadership just in kind of a depth role um how do you guys feel about maybe shelby harris haven't watched any of him, so couldn't tell you. <laughs> no, I think obviously there's a, there's a big connection there. And, you know, he tweeted about um, Lamondo and how much he was going to miss him. It seems like he's going to stay in Denver. Um, but I'm pretty sure he was playing more of the defensive end role in, there and not the nose tackle, but I could be wrong there. Yeah, I mean, I think he kind of did uh, a couple things there. It, you know, wasn't just pure nose tackle. He was sort of all around the defensive line. Um, I, I just bring him up because of the, yeah, Staley connection, uh, Denver days. Uh, that's sort of what I was thinking there. Um, but, yeah, I think there's a lot of guys you could probably look at that have some interesting potential. Um but yeah, it's not, I, I think the way that you improve defensive tackles probably through the draft as opposed to free agency. Yeah. And you know, it's not a great defensive tackle draft in general. Um, and especially playing a three, four, it's a little tougher. Like, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Davion Nixon from uh, Iowa, but I think he would be more of the defensive end. Uh, you have Levi Onzurike, again, probably more of the defensive end in the three, four, same with Tommy Togi guy really outside of Tyler Shelvin and, you know, later rounds, uh, Kairos Tonga from BYU, who's just a massive, massive human being. There's not really like a clear, okay, like this guy needs to be, you know, drafted for the Chargers to you know, be that guy behind Linval Joseph. So let's be real here. So they don't have, they have Linval Joseph, but he's older. They have nobody behind him. 
they don't have another true defensive end because Jerry Tiller does not count, and I don't think Enchenna Wos is going to play defensive end. So, I, mean, I don't think they have enough outside linebackers. So tell me why they would even transition to this three four to begin with. Well, you know, it's what Staley knows, and like, could he play a four three this year? You know, sure. Uh, I think he's smart enough to figure it out and, and have some four three principles. Mm-hmm. But I mean, the three four defense is what he coached at John Carroll. It's what he's coached in Chicago. It's what he coached in Denver. So you know, could they take a little slower transition to it while they figure out the personnel? Sure, like that that could make some sense. But you know, I think if you're you know in your base three four set, if you have Unwosu, Bosa, Joseph, Justin Jones, and then you know insert drafty outside linebacker here. You know, I think that's fine. And then you can work in Jerry Tillery with Justin Jones and with Joey Bosa. You put Joey Bosa on the outside. Um, you know, Emma K. Egbule, he's a really good athlete. He, you know, he only played like one game this past year, but, you know, he showed some good, good signs in New Orleans. So could they take a slower transition there to fit the personnel? Yeah, I think they could. But, you know, Brandon Saley, he's coached a three four his entire defensive career. So, you know, I think you brought him over to be a defensive genius and you got to let him do what he knows best, which is the three, four defense. Plus it's not like, uh, it's not like these guys were getting a lot of pressure in the four three anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that might yeah. just be the reality of it. I mean, you know, I, I think that that might be part of it, right? If you go to a Staley three, four, that might just kind of be like a new shot of blood kind of into the defense. I, I think that that's possible. Yeah. Just maybe making the move a little bit quicker. Um, I definitely think it's a radical change from uh, four three, but I right. I, we we've talked about the fact that you can kind of fit the game around Bosa and, and let the game come to him, right? They're obviously not going to be dropping Joey Bosa into pass coverage or doing any of these yeah. uh, things. So I think yeah, right. As uh, as Staley has said many times, right? It's all about the three four, but you fit it around your stars like you know Jalen Ramsey and Derwin James or Joey Bosa and Aaron Donald. I guess we'll find out what the plan is after the draft and free agency. It's really hard to tell. It's so yeah. hard to figure out what this team wants right now. Yeah, no, I think we have a little more clear vision on offense just based off of who they've hired, right? Like we know it's going to be a mix yeah. of the Saints and the Shanahan system. Um, so that's, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how that pans out. But, you know, defensively, like, you know, what if Staley is sitting there going, you know what, I am going to play Joey Bosa at outside linebacker and only outside linebacker. And all of us are just thinking like, oh, okay, like, yeah, you know, so Staley, you know, I think Staley's going to throw a lot of curveballs at us. And honestly, like, we might not know, you know, who's going to play where, like, what if he turns Derwin James into a freaking linebacker? And all of us are just like, okay, Kenneth Murray and Derwin James, let's go. Gotta be down for that. <laughs> yeah, I'd watch I would that. be down for it too. I w- <laughs> Sometimes you have random ideas that work out really well, I guess. <laughs> when you have Derwin James, every idea works out. <laughs> yeah, honestly, man. And that's more reason why you could uh, sign John Johnson and play him at strong safety during James, a linebacker. Mm, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I was writing about John Johnson today and like, it, it makes so much sense for what Brandon Staley wants to do mm-hmm. because, you know, as soon as you pop on, you know, the Rams tape, like they run a lot of three, four, but they're, they almost always have five, six defensive backs on the field. And, you know, sure, some of that was personnel because their linebacker core is trash. But, you know, I think in a world where you can put John Johnson, Nasir Adderley, and Derwin James at safety, and then you have Chris Harris, Casey Hayward, Michael Davis, like, I'm okay with that world. I I still think Casey Hayward should probably get cut. Like, I know everybody doesn't want to talk about that. But the idea of Casey Hayward playing so much man-to-man defense, like, it worries the hell out of me because he's never been that guy. He's always been a zone or a mm-hmm. slot guy. So, you know, I'm a little worried there, but, <laughs> you know, I'm going to trust Brandon say they figured out uh, if case, if he wants Casey Hayward on the team, then I'm cool with it. Yeah. I feel like the Casey Hayward front has been really quiet, uh, which makes me feel like he might not be on this team next year. Cause we've heard yeah. a lot from Chris Harris. So much from Chris um, Harris. He's definitely <laughs> on the team. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've heard about from Ronaldo Hill from, you know, uh, from Brandon Staley himself, like, there's been so much on that and it's just like uh i don't know um if you it, the difficult thing about casey as you said is just like man to man i i don't know if i trust him as the guy it's like and it's not like you know he was beat by 
you know, two months this year, a lot of the times it was just getting beat out by size, like the Mike Evans battle or like, um, you know, just getting beat purely by speed, you know, with his age and injuries. I, I, I don't really know how he would fit in a system where he has to move around a lot and, and do all these things. You know, he, <laughs> he's certainly not Jalen Ramsey. Um, and that's just the issue in terms of plugging him into this offense. And, you know, I think other than Turner, I think he's the one where they can save the most money by cutting him because I think he's due like 11.7 so. million and he has 2 million in dead cap. So you save about 9.7. Um, and when you have a number that big and a corner who doesn't quite fit, you know, it makes you think about it. I think if Anthony Lynn and Gus Bradley would come back, uh, or, or something like that, and they were still playing 4-3, I think Casey coming back would be a lot more likely. Yeah. But I, I I just have had trouble placing him into, like, how he fits both in the cap and just, like, in a construction of this kind of defense that they're trying to build. I think they're okay enough for the cap where they'll keep him around. I just – I don't know how many holes they can anticipate plugging this, this offseason. So I just don't know if cutting your starting corner – granted, maybe it doesn't fit – Maybe he's over the hill. I just, I don't really see how cutting him and making another really significant hole, assuming you can even get Davis back, is going to really benefit the team. But, you know, he tossed around the idea of Patrick Peterson, a guy who's, you know, kind of similarly over the hill, but way more athletic. So at least he can keep up. So yeah. I don't know. And you have AJ Bouye in that same, yeah. same ring. And so I would personally not do that. I think like, you know, the, to me, like if you cut Casey Hayward, it's to free up, you know, money to go get, you know, a Leonard Floyd mm -hmm. or, you know, a bigger offensive line target. And then you could, you know, take a corner at 13 or in the second round to replace mm -hmm. that, you know, Northwestern's Greg Newsom is, is a really hot name right now. I think he would make a lot of sense in this scheme. Um, so to me, like if you cut Casey Hayward, it's to go sign a pass rusher and then maybe mm -hmm. take a, a chance on a low-level signing like an A.J. Bouye, who some somebody was like, oh, well, if he's low-cost, wouldn't that make him more popular for other teams? And it's like, no. <laughs> if he's low-cost, he's going to be low-cost. So, you know, I, I, th I do think that the three corners from last year are going to be brought back, and maybe you take a shot on day three on another corner, which they absolutely should, in my opinion, because – Brandon Faison should not be the, the first cornerback off the bench. Uh, that experiment has failed. So it's going to be interesting to see. But free agency is just under, I think, three weeks away. And we're going to get, you know, a lot of intel on what this team's vision is in terms of the roster. As soon as they cut Trey Turner and Casey Hayward, for example, it's like, okay, like offensive line and cornerback become a huge priority. Out of curiosity, I don't know if there's a fact or whatever on this. What takes longer to figure out how to do in the NFL? Be an offensive tackle or a corner? Because I just think about... that the Chargers could make their run next year in Staley year two. And I'm just curious who you could draft that year versus someone you need to draft this year to develop so they're ready by that next year. You know, that's an interesting question because, I mean, the short answer, the easy answer is that it just kind of depends. But, mm -hmm. you know... I think if you're drafting a first rounder, I think it's probably easier for a cornerback traditionally. Um, okay. But then again, like last year, Jeff Okuda, who I loved and was a no brainer cornerback one for me really, really sucked last year. <laughs> Jalen Johnson, my guy out of Utah was a second round pick and he was amazing. And mm -hmm. uh, Darnell Holmes was a fifth round pick and for the giants and he was amazing. So, I mean, it, it kind of depends. I, I feel like traditionally, a cornerback is more plug and play than an offensive or plug and play at a high level. Uh, maybe that might be changing. I don't know because last year we saw Jedrick Wills, Tristan Wirfs, and Mikai Beckton all get drafted and have monster years for their team. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a that's an interesting question, and I have to do some research there. But um, I think at 13 in this year's class, I think it's easier to get a first round starter at offensive tackle than it is at cornerback because I think Patrick Sertan. And Caleb Farley are probably gone at 13. And I love JC Horn, mm -hmm. but you know, he's got some really grabby tendencies that he's going to have to get rid of to be an NFL cornerback because that stuff doesn't fly in the NFL. <laughs> um, but you know, I think it's easier probably this year to grab a first round starter at offensive tackle. Okay. A name that I think is a little bit interesting in the way that I mentioned uh, Jerry Itachu 
uh, at cornerback is uh, Jason Verrett. I mean, he's going to be a free agent. I know I'd be so people. happy if he came back. I love Jason. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I put up the YouTube Q&A and someone mentioned him. Uh, and uh, I, I just think that would be an interesting fit. Uh, he is probably going to be pretty cost effective. And, you know, you're betting on him for a year or two to be healthy. But he did just show you that he can be healthy for a year. Um, so, you know, I, that that would be kind of an interesting uh, bet for the team to make. Oh man, prime Jason Verrett is like one of my favorite oh, Charger so players good. of all time. Like the way that he, I will never ever forget that Monday night game and how he locked up Antonio Brown. I know they lost the game, but the way that Jason Verrett just went at it with Antonio Brown, so much fun to watch. Yeah, he had a stretch where it was, I mean, a little bit of uh, Golden Tate slash Calvin Johnson, Antonio Brown, prime Chicago Bears, also on Jeffrey. I mean, some of the best corner play. I, I think he would have been a better corner than Casey Hayward in his 100%. prime because 100 Brett was just something special yeah it truly is one of the biggest what if you mm-hmm. know debates about the charters because you know not just that because you had him and trevor williams play at a high level at the same time and then neither of them were ever healthy again which was just so unfortunate yeah um all right guys any other thoughts before we wrap up today's show uh, can we start updating the uh, coaching, you know, <laughs> I know and everything, oh my you know, because we finally got like confirmation like a month after Lynn was fired that I guess George Stewart is gone now based <laughs> on the team website. Yeah. Uh, can, can we just get just tell us the coaching staff so we have some news to talk about. We had to make up a lot of bullshit to talk about. Today, so. <laughs> Preferably by next show. Give us like some more morsels yeah. of things to talk about. Yeah, you know, I was so excited because the PR guy, I forget his name. I want to say his name is Josh. Um, you know, he ends the press conference for Justin Herbert yesterday. And he's like, oh, by the way, tomorrow we're going to get an update on the coaching staff. Uh, and then nothing happened today. So uh, maybe by the time you, you all are listening to this, Brandon Staley will have had his press conference and have announced some stuff. Uh, but I was a little disappointed today to not get anything. <laughs> All I know is I'm going to find out wherever Ronaldo Hill likes to go out for drinks. I'm going to get him a shit face and he'll say everything about this offensive <laughs> coaching staff. We'll find out everything through him. Oh, man. Speaking of shit face, man, Tom Brady. Oof. Those, yeah. those middle legs hit him hard today. <laughs> All right, uh-huh, guys. None of us drink. Ha ha ha. I know. So I, I tweeted that out and somebody was like, how do you watch Chargers games sober? And it's like, well, I've never had alcohol in my life. Uh, and it's pretty easy once you don't ever do it. Remember when we were all gonna drink when the if the Chargers lost to the Jets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that was fun. Good times. <laughs> all right, you guys. Well, that'll do it for today's show. Thanks again to Dalen Hayes for taking his time out to discuss with us. Uh, as always, please subscribe to that YouTube channel. Hit the like button. Uh, if you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, please leave us a review. Uh, we are always checking that if you have questions, like Alex has always mentioned, you know, you want to do the mailbag. If you have a question that you're dying to answer to ask us, uh, hit us up with a review and ask that question there. Thanks for tuning in and we will see you guys next time. Rest in peace, Marty Schottenheimer. Oh yeah. Good call. I appreciate it guys. Yeah, man, Thank you. you. All right guys. Have a good night.